It's the moment that set back Iowa football, yeah. without a doubt. That's essentially when Brian Ferentz's career ended. Ended. And Kirk took over. Welcome back to the ANF Podcast, where we cover Iowa sports. Today we're going to do a recap of the Iowa Northwestern game, uh, then do a brief preview of the Rutgers uh, Iowa game this upcoming Saturday. Mm-hmm. Wrap it up with some thoughts on Brian Ferentz's departure, and then uh, finally get us some picks at the end of the day. Another positive weekend for Iowa football, at least from the results standpoint, mm-hmm. wasn't pretty on the field. But you have now Minnesota losing at home to Illinois, Nebraska dropping one against uh, Michigan State, Michigan State, <clears throat> and then Wisconsin losing to Indiana. And you talk about three teams they lost to, all three bottom tough. barrel Big Ten teams. Yeah. That's three tough losses, especially yeah. this time of the year. Now, you know, I was essentially was already in the driver's seat or kind of controlled its own destiny. But now, you know, if you get one or two more results from Minnesota losing to Ohio State, which is almost a given to now Nebraska, if they lose to Maryland or to uh, Wisconsin, you know, they're also in a position of not being able to win the West unless we drop two. Well, no, I think that's that's very important given what we just saw again this weekend. Mm-hmm. We've, we've played this out, you know, three weekends in a row, but... Almost it's not fine gonna, now, it feels like. Yeah, it's not going to get any prettier. And the fact that we now have some cushion built in, mm-hmm. you know, I, I just expect that uh, Nebraska will lose one game to either Maryland. Wisconsin or yeah. Maryland. You know, those are two decent teams, and they've struggled to score the ball. Mm-hmm. Uh, Minnesota obviously has still has the bear of Ohio State on it, and they're only favored by one point this weekend against Purdue. Mm-hmm. So while we wouldn't like to see a 9-3 and Iowa team go to the Big Ten title game, it's a reality. It's a reality of it, and having that opportunity in general with – how the season's played out is pretty yeah, crazy. And any fan that says, you know, I don't want to go to the Big Ten title game because I don't want to get embarrassed. Just not the fans you should be caring about. No. Not the people you should be surrounding yourself if you're an Iowa <laughs> fan. Is that When you hear that statement, it's just yeah. like, what do you, you have an opportunity to compete for a Big Ten title. Well, you have technically, you know, the line's going to be 20-plus points unless it's probably Penn State again. I could see being around 14. But you never know. Yeah. It's a bounces game. Yeah. The defense can make a play in the first half. Of all half. teams, Iowa can pull you into a muck fest pretty fast. Right. And if that game's close in the late in the third quarter and it's a four point game, you're going to be so happy we're there. And the nerves are going to flip. Right. And that one, like, if you can put the pressure back on the better team, and especially in a big moment like that where those teams are likely going to have a playoff appearance on the line, right. You just got to make one or two plays. Yeah. Uh, but let's move into the breakdown of the defense. I think the first thing we have to talk about is it was the pinnacle of the game on Saturday yeah. was the defensive stand. The stop. Yeah. <clears throat> this plays into essentially every aspect of Iowa football, mm-hmm. down to the players they recruit, uh, the mentality they bring every week. The mindset they have. Yeah. And it all played out in four plays. Also, the practice time devoted to this. The, the contact you have on a weekly basis that you have in practice. I'm guessing Iowa Pi practices goal line, you know, contact on Wednesdays. More than any other team in the country or up there with. Because the way we execute those situations and the confidence and kind of the want to to play out that situation shows that we are super prepared. And it just, like you mentioned, it's built into the mentality of this team. Well, in most teams, if you get a first and goal at the two, like they understand the the assets in front of them. They're going to have to make, you know, essentially four one yard stands uh, when they have, you have every uh, play at your disposal. Mm-hmm. If you, make one mistake. If any player doesn't give its full effort there, it's right. a touchdown. And Northwestern, actually, going back and watching them against Maryland, you know, they succeeded really well in short yard situations. I think they ran it in on first and goal on Maryland in their first possession. Power off the left side, double team, move the D tackle down or DN down two gaps, and they walked in. So when it actually first happened, we were in that end zone above, right, right above that play or those plays, and I go, well, this is actually what Northwestern does well. They mm-hmm. are built big. They are a power football team. I assume they'll get in at some point. You can go back. And we're going to break down a couple of different aspects of these plays. But uh, the, I mean, the first play, Higgins over the top. Second so, play. Oh, because it was, was it power on the first play? First play was lead ISO to the left or power to the left. And that's where Herkett. Herkett had, if you watch the first play, Herkett has a great lockout on the tight end. Yep. If that tight end wins in any fashion, turns him in any sense, wins that block, Herkett does exactly how he's coached up to do, locks out, stalemates him, and even kind of pushes him back a little bit, and yeah. it ends up kind of clogging the entire play. Yep. And then the next play where Higgins goes over the top, I mean, that has to be perfectly timed. Mm-hmm. And then more importantly, though, it's the the four players underneath who are, you know, submarining the play right. that have to win. Which they did every single play. Yeah. So we actually, we coach up in our goal line situation. You look at all of our defensive linemen, they're all in four-point stances. 
and they're all kind of almost submarining before the play even starts, which as an offense to walk up to, it's actually six guys in a line, yeah. all in a four point stance and all like as an offensive lineman, the first thing you want to do is have leverage under your, the player you're blocking. Mm-hmm. If the guy goes submarines towards your knees, the play is over. Yeah. And so we coach up that everyone, if you're a defensive lineman on that play, you just attack the other team's knees and cause a pile. And it worked perfectly in all, all four plays. And that was second and fourth down where that happened. Yeah. Where Higgins went over the top both times. Higgins on third down might have made the linebacker play of the century. I, I, I you talk about you century, talk about from yeah. like fourth grade football on where you start playing tackle football and you do Oklahoma drills. Mm-hmm. You know, two on ones, one on ones. Right. And it's about, you know, meeting a guy in a hole. Mm-hmm. You can't give up a yard here. Yeah. I mean that that was about as textbook of a play. As you could possibly imagine. I, I still don't know how he did it. No, it doesn't make any you see the guy go into the hole and you always just see a guy, you know, roll off of yeah. a dude. Well, because he, he can't had, let him go. He can't give him an inch either way. Because all the guy does have to turn off one shoulder. Yeah. He has to just get a slight edge on either or and just roll off of him anyway. And Higgins didn't meet him two yards in the backfield, didn't no. meet him a yard off. He met him on the goal line and then just won the fight. Yeah. And it was one of those plays where you're like, it is kind of a, you know, crazy thing to say, a play of the century by a linebacker, but I can't remember. I think Anger had a stop maybe in 2009 against Minnesota or something like that, where you have this linebacker just, you know, basically hold the line to that extent, but not hold it, but then also drive the guy back. And the guy, the running back for Northwestern, 230, 240 pounds. He was full speed going into the play. He's a six-step sprint, and Higgins won it. And it just kind of exemplified, you know, we we go into the preseason and going into the season, uh, I remember Utah State specifically, I said, you know, Middle linebacker is a massive question mark. Yep. We're losing Jack Campbell. When Iowa loses generational players at positions, it's not just a step down, it's a massive step down. And Linderbaum and Hawkinson, there's no way we've replaced Campbell. And I think this is the first time where we've actually lost, you know, a generational talent and plugged one in right away. Yeah. And such a such a credit to the Iowa program and such a credit to Higgins for sticking it out. And how much he must have absorbed over his four year, three years beforehand, how much he sat in media rooms and cared, how much he tried to exemplify Campbell and Benson. Like, you don't just step into middle linebacker at Iowa and actually not only not have a drop-off, but he's, you know, played to Campbell's level, yes. which I never thought in a million years I'd say Higgins is actually just as good as Campbell was. and Which I, is I think, honestly almost more impressive than what we saw from Campbell's final year because correct. Campbell had two and a half years of experience to start. 100%. We're talking about Higgins seeing no live bullets or very few, especially in the middle linebacker spot mm-hmm. outside of a spring practice where he led the ones prior yeah. to the 2022 season that like they came out of like, man, Higgins should probably be starting for us. And we're like, yeah. oh, wow. That's, he started that's stealing nice reps because he was so good in that practice that, like, but spring. Yeah. To have no experience and then to go into the season, have the season he's had, it's just a testament to how well he's prepared. Yeah. You know, he probably knew he was always a really good player, mm-hmm. but to have that actualized and yeah, I, I can't imagine a more I, rewarding moment, especially after that play. That's yeah. we were talking about his strength all season, where when he touches guys, it's oh, like just, the touch of de- touch of death. Yeah, but now it's gotten to the point where it's like that's a that's a heroic play. Yeah, it's just you just don't see those type of plays, and it just credit to him for sticking it out. Yeah, and just blown away by how well he's played this year. Yeah. Well, now, outside of that, I mean, you go back to the stats on this day. It's like I think Northwestern averaged. 2.2 2. 2 yards of carry, something mm-hmm. like that. They, they they threw for less than 100 yards. Yeah. Uh, it's not like they were on the they shared possession with us. So, mm-hmm. it's, again, just another dominant day. Yeah. And the offense had opportunities to length this lead out, maybe not by, you know, a touchdown or so, but, you know, mm-hmm. we could have could have used six points, which we gave up. Right. Uh, but I think at this point we can move now into the offense breakdown. Yeah. As anticipated, we did expect a, a fair amount of boot pass. You know, we saw boot passes, the curls, yep. to the wide side of the field. Uh, and that's just a, a product of having no flat defenders in Northwestern's defense. Yep. They're playing their corners at eight yards and cover four and cover six, you know, or at least one covers and one corners and cover four, you know, at that eight yard mark. And it was the, you know, game plan all, all game. Then we saw, finally, we got to see our first uh, look at Cooper playing offense. Right. I think it was, that was the jet sweep. That was just our typical reverse action. The reverse. We usually run that with Regani. Yep. And we gave it to Cooper. Yeah. And it was just odd to see him with the ball on the offensive side. Right. Oh, it it kind of felt like an appeasement thing. It we're did. like, all right, here, see, we're helping, we're doing our job now. Yeah. And then you get one more rep and then he's off. Yeah. And they faked it to him the next time. I'm like, oh, that's what you should be doing probably every drive. I wouldn't be surprised. I don't think they're going to risk it these next three games. Maybe if we get into Nebraska, you might see closer to three or four reps, maybe mm-hmm. two or three carries. 
But if you get into the Big Ten championship game, and it's like potentially his last meaningful game as a Hawkeye. Right. That's where I could see it being like, okay. Ten touches type yeah, deal. Yeah, yeah. So some insane thing where we're like, we're going to get you the ball every single, like, yeah. Session. He's definitely going to have, like, some package. Like, they probably, knowing Kirk, he's going to simplify it for him. He's going to be like, all right, you're in 11 personnel only. You're in this set where you are jetting every play. And he's going to he's gonna make it so limited for him so it's not like he's got a wildcat package. He's got, you know, an under center package. He's got, you know, a 12 personnel package. It's going to be one personnel package, I think. And Kirk's going to be like, I'll, limit, I'll give you that. It would be awesome if he throws it. Right. Yeah, you toss him to one time and he can throw I mean, it. That, that, that will be my Big Ten championship uh, play call. Yeah. If I had to call one, it will be Cooper DeGene throwing the football. It will be the exact reverse we saw trying to attack a zone defense coming up on the outside. Yeah. Similar how we've been attacked in that same situation. You know, s- similar uh, struggles we've seen some, from Deacon. You know, took a, took a pretty painful strip sack on our first possession that pushed us out of field goal range. Mm-hmm. Uh, threw a very poor pick uh, at the end of the half. Again, I mean, th- that might be one of Regani's last reps, too, or Ragaini. You yeah. know, he like he struggled with strengths at the top of routes. You can think back to the Iowa State pick he gave up earlier this year when mm-hmm. Kate was still playing. Uh, he's just not a very strong guy. And yeah. I understand the ball wasn't well thrown. That's why I'd, I'd point to more. I'd say it's leaning towards on Deacon of just putting that ball. Oh, he put no, it's a, it was a very, very poorly thrown ball. Right. I'm not saying that, but you have to, as even if you're going to get an offensive PI, yeah, I am, yeah, you have to give a better effort than he. Yeah, did he just there. doesn't have the lower body to compete at that moment. Yeah, like it just the strength that you actually need at receiver when the at the top of your routes he hasn't shown all year. And then it, it, it's it's at this point it's like a spiritual moment when we get a block punt. You right. know, it's like it's almost like oh, of course there it is. Like yeah. like it was, it was eventual happening. Mm-hmm. The, anti, the crisis returned, uh, but that's. That's really how we're going to have to piece together this offense. Mm-hmm. We've said it a million times, it's going to be bounces, but we've seen even the running game fall off even more these past two games than they have in the past. Right. And now, and with, now with more offensive line injuries, mm-hmm. uh, you're going to have to rely on Deacon to make some throws. Yeah. You're going to have to rely on our receivers to grow up a bit. And, mm-hmm. you know, we saw Caleb Brown's first catch of the year, and it was a super meaningful one. Yeah. I think there was actually from this game, you know, it wasn't very interesting on our offensive production, but there was a lot of personnel you know, decisions that were made post bye week. And we kind of mentioned that November football for Iowa's, you know, all right, essentially our first part of the season's done. We have our bye week. Now we reset our team. Who who do we want to get out there? Who do we want to have playing the most? We saw the most snaps for Caleb Brown and most targets for him in a long time. It seems like now he's a part of the rotation. He just entered the depth chart. Uh, Bostic, who we've been clamoring for since even last year as a true freshman, he actually got a snap this game, which is great to see because he's actually, a, you know, a true body out there where, I can envision him making plays, and he was probably my favorite receiver recruit over the last two years. Yep. So it's exciting to see him play because we need that guy to perform. If yeah. we're going to have any some of its receiver room, he needs to start getting. He's got snaps. the height to at least operate, you know, a back shoulder game. Yeah, he can. He's a true X, a, a, a true post. I'd say he's probably the closest thing. Obviously, he did not built up, you know, the size of Brand Smith, but he's essentially the same recruit as Brand Smith. Jumps forty inches, yep. good size, you know, good acceleration. Needs to stay healthy. And then, actually, interesting moment. You know, we were claiming for, you know, Joe to get a shot at backup QB. Marco was taking the snaps with the two. And Deacon continuously puts himself in situations where, you know, he's not taking care of the ball and he's not performing either, other than one big time throw he had in the last drive. The backup QB position is open. It's not for Joe anymore. It's Marco. And it, I think that actually would be the best case scenario for all the QBs in the room. Because he's got running back legs. Yeah, he's he could be a Joe's bo- he good could be like a borderline four star running back if he played running back solely. Right, he and he could play. It's essentially like Joe Lanning and uh, who's the Michigan State QB from last year? It's playing at NIU. Rocky Lombardi. Lombardi. He's Lombardi and Lanning. Where yeah. he's like, this guy should be playing linebacker. Yeah, and he could be at QB for us. If you want to talk about, we talk about manufacturing offense through these running QBs. You could create an entire offense on running this guy and creating. Well, plays. him and boot action would be an actual threat. Yeah, you know, you get him out there with pace, and then he's got an opportunity. Like you don't mind him taking contact no. from a safety or linebacker. He's bigger. He's just he's as gonna big be, as he's gonna be as big as them. Yeah. So that that's always the fears when you're gonna run your QB outside of you know your typical QB read where you could maybe get him on the edge, you can get out of bounds, he can slide or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, with Mark, you're not gonna really have to hide him out there. Right. And 
my, my fear is because I really want to see it happen. Mm-hmm. I really think he could come out and just be the guy you give 10 to 12 touches a game to, and he keeps you on schedule. I don't think he's going to have you know accuracy issues like Deacon. I mean, he might, but at this point, I would take that trade off to have a guy with legs. Yeah, it just because there is there is no true like when the offense takes a field. I've come so you know this is just not going to work. Just and, please don't make a, a backbreak. Right. Mistake. I'm just thinking like even on the last drive of the game, I'm like, don't throw a pick. Yeah. Like don't lose us here. And with Marco, you would actually kind of have that ability to like you'd feel confident that like he could find a way to get first downs. Yeah. And. There was no difference between this performance and the Minnesota week prior. No. The result was the only thing different about the offense. Yeah. And Marco could actually lean into, you know, getting first downs and giving Iowa's offense, you know, to 250 yards of offense. Yeah. Like, that, that, that's a reality with him. That's a winning number probably for the rest of the season, though. Right. To be the 130th rated offense. Yeah. Instead of 134. Yeah. Time to get into Rutgers? Yeah, I, I think my only point, though, is after Deacon made that throw – Oh yeah, it's over. Yeah, <laughs> there's no way Kirk goes away from him. Yeah, it's just like Kirk just saw like the okay, this he was in a pressure moment. Yeah, to now take it away and put it in the freshman's hands. That's like antithetical to everything Kirk. Yeah, when unless he, it, unless unless we lose a game mm-hmm. because of, I mean it's going to be because of Deacon, but unless we lose a game, I don't see Marco getting a chance because chance. it just could be one of oh, those yeah, I agree. psychological things that Kirk goes into. It's well, like we're winning for, with this for guy for Deacon to survive the bye week. Yeah, like you had your moment for your two week training period to run a QB out there. The only thing that we changed was Joe got benched and Marco was a QB too. So that's like their big QB move in their heads. Like if Marco would have came out, you know, that was his opportunity to actually win it. Yeah. Was actually go, you know, put him as a one. I, I couldn't see him jumping from three to one no, though. No, I don't, I don't think that's possible. I think the only, the only possibility for it is that, you know, they never make QB changes mid game, mm-hmm. but they could after, that first three quarters from Deacon be like, okay, that's it. Like yeah. he, he threw the pick we didn't need. Well, he nearly threw the worst pick of all time. He's starting to make these crazy. That crazy yeah. spinning throw that could have been pick six to exactly. tied at seven, seven. So I'm, I'm, I'm again, I'm afraid though that that one throw is going to save his job. Yeah, I think it will. I yeah. think, I think that that's all Kirk needs to see is a 15 yard out route. When is the game? Yeah. Go see, see, that's I was right doing. the whole time. Exactly. Yeah. I think it's time to move on to Rutgers. Yeah, let's do it. We are happy to announce a new sponsor for the ANF podcast. The ANF podcast is sponsored by Eye Surgeons Associates, proudly serving Eastern Iowa and Western Illinois for all your eye care needs for over 40 years. I think starting with their offense first, they're, once again, we've been saying this forever, another dual threat QB. Yep. Wimzat is a true runner against Indiana. I think he carried the ball like 15 times. Like, in majority of them were just QB powers. Mm-hmm. They just run them off tackle. Like, he wouldn't even, sometimes they wouldn't even fake to the running back. They'd just QB power them, just like Northwestern did a few times, just like Michigan State did. And that's going to be the game plan again for him. They do have a true running back in Manungai. He's gotten 24 carries in three straight games and over 150 yards in every game. And that's against Ohio State, Michigan State, and Indiana. Yeah. And it's going to have success, some success in the run game, no doubt. They are. And it's not the, and also, this is the, uh, Kirk Soraka offense. So this is the old PJ Fleck coordinator from 2016 to 2019. Cool. Yep. And then again, the one 21 yeah. to 2022. He it's back to early PJ days where it's or early Minnesota days where it's true 11 personnel the entire time. Like they're in 11 personnel, nearly every play it's inside zone, the majority of the calls. And then, Less, I'd say, throwing over the middle. Yeah, it's not as much RPO to slant. It's a lot more outside the numbers throws. Right. What I'm saying, it does have, he does make some impressive throws from time to time. Mm-hmm. Doesn't have a, a super strong arm. So, at, I mean, we've talked, it's almost like we're playing the same team over and over again. Right. You're going to see a lot of pr- uh, press coverage out wide. Mm-hmm. We're going to force him to essentially beat us with a deep ball. I don't even know if they'll ever go to it. Uh, I think they threw against uh, Michigan State a few times trying to back him up. I, I still think, again, with these teams that, are playing such a bad offense on the other side. I mean, we saw Northwestern take one deep shot right. that they almost executed, but I don't, I don't think it'll be a main part of their game plan unless they go down or unless they're feeling like they're having no success in the run game. Yeah, Just because, again, field position is going to be at a priority. Mm-hmm. Not making the big mistake is going to be at the highest right. priority. Which, if we've played a QB in the last six weeks that can make the big mistake, it's Wimsett. Yeah, He's less than 50% completion. I remember watching him even week one against Northwestern. He had four or five throws that were 
Dangerous. Very inaccurate. Yeah. Like he'll miss by, it's kind of like Ethan for Minnesota, but he'll miss over the middle of the field. Yeah. High or low, you know, behind, he'll have misreads with his receivers. And that's how you get to 49%. So there is an opportunity for interceptions here. Like you mentioned, I'm guessing they're going to take the ball out of his hands a little bit. Yeah. And they're going to run him a bunch. I think against Indiana, which it was their most comfortable win, I think he had 12 pass attempts and five completions for 30 something yards. Like this guy's just a deacon with legs. Yeah. And that's how they're going to treat him a little bit. Yeah. I, I think we'll get him. We'll just see a team that's, going to be terrified of making the big mistake and that's going to lead to some low offensive numbers from them mm -hmm. but uh that could be enough to win if we make the mistake yeah no it definitely can and they're gonna it's minnesota had the best idea just keep on running yeah and soraka and knows that soraka too. Know, like soraka's yeah. had success just keep on pounding the ball yeah they're gonna try to drag the, their this game's going to the fourth quarter yeah there's gonna be a point where our defense has 35 carries against us and if we don't have a lead where we can back up or we, we are trying to get a stop that run game might come into effect where, you know, a QB power on third and four might be the backbreaker, you know, yeah. with eight plays in the drive or something like that. Exactly. So it's definitely going to have that same flow to almost every game we've watched since Deacon's taken over. And it's this well-coached team, team, team that's going to commit to the run, and they're going to play good defense. So it's going to be a one-score game in the fourth. Yeah. We can move on against what we expect from their defense against our offense. Yeah. They've had a very good defense to this point. They, you know, they really made it dif life difficult on Ohio State for much of that game. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw them completely shut down Northwestern early in the year. Yeah, they've had some in between games where they've had a little more explosive plays happen against them, but still, we know it from the game we played against them last year. They they are a, a team that can stop the run. Mm -hmm. and they play. I guess I'd say it's actually more zone this year than it was last year. I feel like they played a lot of man to man against us last mm -hmm. year. But I have seen them uh, utilize more zone. And they're going to press us. They're not going to – Northwestern kind of didn't change their style to match our personnel. Yeah. Like, the, if you're going to play Iowa offense, press the receivers at one yard. Mm -hmm. And I think we saw that against Northwestern when they played Northwestern. They are like, these guys aren't running by us. Yep. And they, they made, you know, the onus on them to throw deep. So this is going to be back to Deacon trying to take shots out of play action or maybe, you know, out of five wide. It's not going to be this Northwestern offense where you're, you know, have these in routes and out routes that are going to be, you know, off coverage and having the ability to just step into your throw. It's going to be making us press the ball downfield rather than taking, you know, the boots or yeah. The I think there'll seem a lot more uh, longer developing crossing routes to try and attack that. Yeah, I don't know who that's going to go to. Potentially, you know, maybe you'll see a Caleb Brown get in, uh, inserted there, Seth Anderson. Yeah. Um, I don't. I think the tight ends against man to man are usually who we utilize, just mm -hmm. because it's our, you know, it's a, our best matchup. Usually have a safety or linebacker trying to play man to man. Right. Uh, but again, it's like you're going to have to develop something in the run game. You can't be putting the ball in Deacon's hands 25, 30 times, 30 times in this game. Mm -hmm. I, I would expect if they're going to see more, you know, up coverage that will eventually start moving to more seam shots. Mm -hmm. You know, looking back at that Minnesota game, seam shots is actually where we should have gone. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think we we're just scared to throw a noob in and make a, mix, make a mistake there. But yeah. Uh, with a team that's going to force the issue, that's a lot scarier than what we played last week where you could, right. you could have the disastrous play off a tip pass or off a missed throw by Deacon rather than uh, Northwestern, who's going to let you usually operate how you want to. Yeah, definitely. And it's a kind of a requirement of this team. You watched it. I watched the records Michigan State game live. I was cheering for Michigan State at the time. Um, they were one of my picks. And everyone on this team plays hard. They all play physical, you know, Shiano is a former NFL coach. He came back here and he's, you know, doing a great job of getting Rutgers to play hard. Also, we don't have the opportunity to take advantage of their special teams. It's it's a paramount focus of Rutgers football is to be elite at special teams. Mm -hmm. So it's it's hard to really kind of see the the route to a clean victory here, an easy one. It's just how we went to Northwestern. Bounces, big plays, you know, momentum plays. Taking advantage of situation, you know, you get a good drive in the first half or second half, you need points. You yeah, can't you, be you, get a, you get a fortuitous offensive, uh, uh, defensive pass interference against you. You know, yeah. any aspect, you have to take advantage of those moments. Right. You can't you have be to taking place. a strip sack. You can't be throwing bad picks. Yeah. You want to get into predictions then? Now let's go into sp special teams because we wanted to talk about Steve. It's quick. Oh, one. yeah. 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 So an another um, kind of thing, that, a takeaway from the Northwestern game was uh, Drew Stevens' kick. And just his like approach to it, his demeanor. I think there's a post game. I mean, post game interview too. Yeah. There's him. There's a gif of him spinning the ball, you know, as moments before he has to kick the field goal. Yeah. It talks about his preparation after this mindset towards it all, how he just attacked the kick. 
and how he kind of just blacks out like any other athlete does in stressful situations. They just, you know, go into his space. And it, it just summarizes like the specialists on Iowa's team. And it's been, you know, a focus from Kirk from probably since like 2018, since I think LeVar was hired as a full-time special teams coordinator it was around that time period. And how this team has, you know, grown out that that room. But they're the mindset those guys have, you know, they're not the specialists on this team. They're equals to the defense. They are a third of the team. They might see themselves above some of the offensive players. <laughs> yeah. Like the kicker and punter. I'm better like, at this sport than you are. Right. And really. they and they they carry themselves. They're appreciated by their players, the other, you know, defenders and uh, offensive players on the team. And it just shows like they just they have a football mindset towards well, how many how many big games have our punter and kicker won in the past you know five seasons you go through that stretch right i could go through so many different games mm -hmm. you know 2018 was uh keith duncan or no that was who was the 2018 kick that was hawkinson miguel and racinos racinos yeah yeah 2019 several huge kicks i mean you could go through every single year yeah plays kickers hitting you know gigantic game winning kicks mm -hmm. You know, Shudak against in 2021, where he hit three like 40 yard plus field goals against Penn State to keep us in the game. Yeah. You know, Tory Taylor backed him up the entire game. Exactly, and like it gets lost on so many college teams. And it, when you can be ex exceptional in a third of the game, mm -hmm. like that truly becomes a third of the game yeah. through your punting and kicking. You know, and that's it, having this a stretch of place kickers be dominant. Yeah, and that's not going to go away anytime soon. If you, if a, if a team knows you value special teams, like we're going to kick more field goals than anyone. Yeah, we're going to punt the ball more than anyone. Yeah, that is the benefit to recruiting. Mm -hmm. We talk about Kirk not building the correctly recruited team, but he can recruit special teams, which is huge. Yeah, and I think it just summarizes like it brings us right into the Brian Farron situation. Yeah, like how how frustrating our offense has been for the last you know I'd say since twenty twenty one the start of it. Yeah, and even twenty nineteen if you remove COVID's year in twenty twenty. But also have to appreciate what Kirk has built on the defensive side and the specialist side. And he has built it. And you have to, like, account for that's his program as well. Mm -hmm. You can't just say that Kirk's only bad offense. Yep. He, Phil Parker, this is not Phil Parker's defense. This is Norm Parker's defense from the 1980s where Norm Parker was at Michigan State and Kirk played against him and loved this defensive philosophy for a program like Iowa. He brought Norm on his initial staff hire was Norm. Mm -hmm. Phil was a defensive backs coach and got to absorb this type of style. Yep. Got to absorb the essence of Norm Parker as well, of like how this team's going to play, how hard they're going to play, and the recruiting and the defensive recruits you can bring in. So that, as much as Phil Parker, you know, deserves a lot of credit for creating great defenses and actually probably a higher caliber defense than Norm Parker ever did. Yep. You know, for his last, I'd say the last three years. Yeah, between, I mean, the 0 2 to 4 Right, defenses. stretch. Yeah. 09, 08. But once it evolved into, you know, spread defense, I mean, right. uh, spread offense, then we needed to make that jump and Phil made it. Right. But Kirk is, has to be given some respect for letting Phil, you know. Yeah. Understand what he, th he thought would be successful at the college level. Right. You know, you, when you choose a, a defensive scheme, that's that's fairly different from what a lot of teams play too. You know, mm -hmm. heavy zone defense. That's a lot of teaching. Yeah. That's how you develop your practices. That's how you recruit as a whole as well. Yeah. It's you, you don't have to go get four stars to play man to man. Yeah. You don't have to get four stars to rush the passer. You had to build out, you know, you can build late developing three stars into, you know, really good players by their 21 year, like when they're by 21. Yeah. So he's also benefiting his coordinator and benefiting Phil by having this philosophy on defense as well. Certainly. And then also going to the specialists, like Kirk's commitment to special teams since 2018 and hiring LeVar, Ball, or LeVar Woods as a you know specialist coordinator, that's not something most coaches do. That was that he saw that as a weakness of his team and changed it, and it's been a strength ever since. And it was a weakness for a long time. Yep. I'd say even like from like 20, you know, 14 to 2017, we never returned any punts. We you know had no big explosive plays, and now it's actually a strength of our team. And that brings us into the Brian Farron situation. Yeah, where, the blind spot. Yeah, the blind spot. Well, you could see how a team that realizes they're a lead at defense and special teams would attempt to eliminate, you know, any type of error that could set those other two groups back. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, it's it's interesting because when Brian took over, he had, was 2017 his first season as OC? I think it was. Because yes. I think, yeah. I mean, in that season, you had the five touchdown game from Stanley against Iowa State. Mm -hmm. You had the fifty-five point output from against Ohio State. Like you had, I mean, granted that was followed up 
with the 2017 Michigan at State. Wisconsin game yeah. where you had 84 yards of offense. Mm -hmm. And then also mixed in there was uh, the Penn State 2017 game where you had, I think, 140 yards of offense. And then Michigan State, which is a pitiful. Yeah, another Penn pitiful, State. like, yeah, I think 220, 230 in offense. Yeah. Uh, but there was there was signs of hope. You know, you were dealing mm -hmm. with a young QB. You had a freshman receiver, Marset. You had, you know, a sophomore tight end in Hawkins. I mean, in Font and a freshman mm -hmm. in Hawkinson. The pieces were there to evolve into, you know, the – potentially a top 60 offense where you're going to mm -hmm. run the ball, but you have this ability to be explosive and you have this ability to throw the ball. Mm -hmm. And that evolved into 2018 where it all kind of coalesced uh, in back-to-back -back games against Minnesota and uh, Indiana, Indiana, where you had, you know, 45 and 48 put outputs. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was after a Wisconsin game where it actually really wasn't the offense that the defense that it was the defense that let us that down and special teams that let us down against Wisconsin that could have, you know, set us up for a big 10 title, mm -hmm. you know, still like, you know, kind of crescendoing into, okay, Brian was the correct hire here. And since that season, we've seen a, a real drastic downturn. Yeah. In 2019, you had a senior QB with, uh, you know, it was laden with receivers. You had Marset, Brandon Smith, uh, a bunch of guys like Tyron Tracy, Tyron yeah. Tracy. But the issue was you didn't have, you know, that, that, key tight end piece. You know, mm -hmm. Sean Barr was still developing, but Weeding wasn't what we needed him to be mm -hmm. at that time. And Laporta didn't develop until later in that year. And then I think what truly set the program back was 2020. Yep. You got to play fake football for, I think, eight games. Yep. Uh, it's guys where there's no one's in the stands. Uh, it's the, the moment that set back Iowa football, yeah. without a doubt. And it's, you go, you come into the season 2020, everyone was talking about the weapons Petrus is going to have. Mm-hmm. And it was the, you know, focus of our entire team was we're going to throw the ball 40 times a game. Yeah. 35 times a game. We came out against Purdue. I think we threw it 50 times. Or maybe only 30 times in that game. We threw it like 50, 50 times against, against Northwestern. Northwestern. Yeah. So back-to-back -back games are just chucking the ball around. Yeah. And that's essentially when Brian Ferentz's career ended. Ended. And Kirk took over. Yeah. And Kirk's new philosophy of how the offense was going to run from then on was we're going to run the ball in simple sets out of under center, and that's going to be our focus. If we're going to throw, it's going to be out of play action sets or anything, you know, a variation off the run. It's not going to have, you know, this kind of downfield aspect to the passing game unless it's tied to the run game in some way. And we're going to go completely back to the 2000, you know, early 2000s offense, essentially. It truly was. And it had two really, you know, why that worked is you played COVID defenses, so that's not just only you're losing out on Micah Parsons and you're losing out on, you know, key guys on good teams not playing, but also there's no fans in the stands. Mm -hmm. And that but was the, the worst. Will, the willpower to defend the run without anyone without wait, emotion. witnessing the game, without any emotion in the room. Now you think about, you know, Joe it's Rossi's Joe Rossi's defense that yeah. year. Actually had a lot of, you know, good players in its front seven. A ton of good players. Got moved all game. Yeah. Penn State, who... Obviously, they're having, you know, they've been a top five, top 10 defensive unit every year, and they've recruited like that. We blocked them all game. Yeah. And we blocked everybody all season, just running the outside zone. And, and also to, to mention, though, you also had a Lark Jackson, Cole Band were titled in the bomb. Yeah. You know, you, had, a, a, you had that left side could really go and it would have been a productive team <laughs> on any, in any year. In any year. It, but, it w but this was particularly productive because right. of this. Because of those two scenarios. factors. Yeah. Right. And so it, we end up, Going from that COVID year to 2021, we won 12 straight games playing yep. this style. And we won 12 straight games basically eliminating Petrus as a QB, yep. eliminating the receivers, and playing special teams. We had an unreal special teams back then even. Torrey Taylor and Charlie Jones was a punt returner, and you know our, our kicking game was amazing. And we basically just leaned all into the strengths of our team. Mm -hmm. And that rattles up 12 straight wins. And it felt like going into 2021, we were doing – like. It felt like we had the magic potion. Yeah. From as outside fans, I cared a lot and like listen, you know, really focused on the team and what Kirk and Brian thought they had. They re identified and reestablished who they are as a program. Mm -hmm. And you hit that Penn State week, the crescendo of that, and you win the game by punting, running the ball, not turning the ball playing over, playing defense, playing defense. And it just kind of like it perks like this is how you do it. Yeah. And from that point on, that Penn State game, you lose next week to Purdue. And it, the program has never really recovered from that 12 win season or that 12 win streak because we're still playing that football. Yeah. And we just were, Kirk is so hell bent on that's how we're going to play football forever is to eliminate those positions and focus on our strengths. But now it's put us into a position where Charlie Jones transfers, 
Keegan Johnson transfers, Arlen Bruce transfers, maybe for other reasons. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, recruiting took a huge dip this year. We, we brought in no good skill. Yeah. On the entire freshman class. Well, you could also say in parallel, too, it's like if you go through re- QB recruiting. Right. Since. Uh, Why don't we want. I just want to focus like what this is doing to our program, too. Must, like, yeah. we're going to have a hard time recruiting for a long. Like, what receivers coming in the portal? Yeah. What receivers coming from. You know, we have 31, like 34 catches combined by receivers throughout the entire year. And he, they've completely leaned, you know, totally into the system where it's not only hurt us the last two years, become an embarrassment since 2022 in offense. But, I mean, we're, we're going in no different direction right now. Thus, bring in Beth. Yeah. We, we are so sick in the head in this program to think that that 12-win win streak is reality mm-hmm. and what we actually will always be and how we should focus. And it's a blind spot that she is eradicating. And the first step in that is getting rid of Brian. And it's moving on to a new offense coordinator that can maybe bring new ideas in. But it won't do anything to fire Brian unless you can also convince the new hire or influence that new hire. Because if it's an internal promotion, nothing will change. Well, I, I don't think it's going to be an internal promotion. It, it, Bud Meyer has been on the staff for two years now. Uh, it'd be difficult to sell anyone that he's going to have an impactful change to how our our, our, our schemes develop. Mm-hmm. We've, we've mentioned this in the comments of our last video, but Paul Chris feels like a tractor beam for this program. Right. You know, he's had, but he was, they took the reins away from him at Wisconsin from calling plays. They right. forced him to give up that role and give it to, uh, I believe it was Bud Meyer at the time. Mm-hmm. Actually, I might, might be wrong about that, but he was actually, they said they said that for him to go away from it. So yeah. uh, if we're going to stay within our current idea of football, mm-hmm. I think he is our only option that makes any sense. I don't know if there's a single guy in the country that's running power football successfully yeah. that could come into a program like this and be able to counter defenses, mm-hmm. co- defensive coordinators correctly. What we like to see, though, is just, you know, an evolution. Mm-hmm. And I think, I don't think Beth, Beth does this unless she has an idea of how she wants the next offense to look. You know, she mentioned in her comments that, uh, you know, we leave the coordinator selection to the head coaches. But we, as an administrator, we always have some say. There's a ton of money floating around the Big Ten right now. And Kirk can't just rely on him being here for 25 years. Like, this, the product's obviously become very stale. Mm-hmm. Like, you, to everyone around you, an uplift is needed. It's very apparent. I think she's going to have some say and be like, okay, if you're going to go with Chris, we have to be more aggressive in our offensive approach. We can't. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, pro- I think I counted at one point during the Northwestern game, uh, Strong side runs, I think we ran like 12 in a row. Mm-hmm. Because it was just, but that's very basic offensive lineman thinking. Mm-hmm. You line up in a set, they're giving you a favorable set, strong side. Yep. Take it. And it's like, man, this is college football. This is mm-hmm. not high school football where your right, your left tackle is going to take the guy back four yards and you're going to win every single time in that mm-hmm. area. So it's going to be very interesting how it, how the actual selection process occurs. Yeah. I think worst case scenario is the internal hire. I'd say B overall grade in my mind would be Paul Christ. Yeah. And I, I honestly think like Beth would be okay with it. Yeah. Because Kirk can sell it as this is my idea still. Yeah. I want to run my program how I want. He does have some historical numbers from 2018 and 2019 where he put up some real numbers. I think Kirk still has leverage in that relationship. As much as this move, you know, killed, you know, got Brian fired, he's still the owner of this athletic department. As much as, you know, Beth is trying to push against that. And the, and the president's trying to make Beth push against it. He still is the elder statesman. And to take his son away from him, I think now he kind of has leverage back in a situation. Yeah. So I have a hard time she's saying she could, if, you know, if he hires Chris, that she has any say in my mind. Because it still would drum up enough, you know, positivity around the program. Best case scenario is he goes and grabs the Kansas OC. Or, you know, some modern OC that's running more of a spread formation that incorporates... QB runs. Like you just, you every- just have to, we've talked about this before, but you have to be able to sell this offense to QBs and receivers. Right. We're, and that's not to say that all of a sudden Iowa's going to start re- recruiting those players at a super high level, but you need to be average in those, at those positions. Yeah. How is Iowa State recruiting, you know, yeah. better receivers and quarterbacks than you are? Yeah. Like that, that should Kansas. Be, that should, why is Kansas? Yeah. Kansas State. All those there's, programs. There's plenty of like programs that can just, you know, they focus on different things. They focus not on arm strength. And I think that's the big thing that we've actually already moved towards with the recruiting of Marco and the recruiting of Rezar. We're focusing more on 
three stars and four low four stars that can run rather than just arm strength. So that's a good step in the right direction. Yeah. But that should be the mantra to the entire offense is build these teams to be more functionally good at getting first downs rather than having an entire playbook. And I think that's that's what the next hire needs to be is just getting to the 80th overall offense like that every single Big 12 team has. You know, there's no Big 12 team that struggles to move well, the ball. It, and I, I, can, I honestly can see the point of staying as a power, like a powerful team. Like it, it does make sense when teams zag, you don't, you don't necessarily have to go with them because mm-hmm. a lot people are going to build smaller defenses. If you can keep this niche uh, power football going and, you know, develop tight ends around that. Yeah. You, you're going to eventually need a receiver. Mm-hmm. Like that's, there's no doubt in my mind. You need one guy. You need a Quintez Cephas yeah. you know, from Wisconsin, the guy that can take the top off for you. But it's also difficult for me to like, Say we oh we need wholesale changes and then we could come out and run what Michigan State's running you know right. Michigan State's running spread but they can't do anything anyways yeah so I think you can probably still lean into what Iowa football does well mm-hmm. I think my biggest gripe with Brian and I think it was c- compounded by his dad being the head coach is neither of them had a, a creative bone in their body that they like about how to design an offense you mm-hmm. know. Brian was basically poaching everything from any other coordinators I've been close to. Mm-hmm. I'm sure, he took a lot from the Patriots. Uh, I'm sure, he took a lot from Ken O'Keefe and, and Greg Davis. But the longer his reign went on, the less creative we got. Right. And I think that was a product of him kind of running out of ideas and not really knowing how to build this, you know, yin and yang offense where it's mm-hmm. all going to flow into each other. You take a guy, a guy like Chris. You know, he's had, he's been an OC at, you know, three different places. Right. Like, there's no doubt in my mind he has an idea of how to make this all fit together. Mm-hmm. And I actually had another, just another hire I thought of too is Kirk Soraka. Yeah. He just went to Rutgers for, you know, not that much money. Not much money. It, there's an easy way to hire him. Yeah. He can play, you want to run the ball. You know, you look at Manungai's stats the last three games, he's doing exactly what we want to do. Yeah. It's not, a, not chucking it around and he's doing that at Rutgers. With the worst offensive line and worst personnel as a whole, and yeah. the worst recruiting bait, like recruiting pitch. Yeah, go hire him and score, you know, thirty points a game. Yeah, I think it's time to wrap it up and do some picks. Yeah, let's do it. Well, I went uh, two and zero last week because we just went uh, Homer bets. Uh, I guess it was actually Northwestern plus six covered, and then the under uh, thirty covered for the over under. Um, I'm just going to stick with the same formula. I'm going to go Iowa minus one and a half against Rutgers. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Rutgers, Iowa under 20 and a half. There's just no reason to balk at any of these unders. You know, if we take any sort of lead, we're going to completely, you know, close down the ship. I think Rutgers is going to try and avoid a catastrophe at every turn. That's going to lead to, you know, I I mean, I I think the score is going to be like 13 to 10. Yeah. I'll, I'll do the same. I'll do, and I'll also take. Uh, what was our last bet? Oh, I'll take Minnesota minus one against uh, Purdue. Yeah, I mean, that's a that's just an overreaction to Minnesota's loss. They're still, you know, a top third Big Ten West team. They're going to run the ball against Purdue, and uh, Minnesota's defense is starting to play well. They just gave up some some big plays late in that game. I'll do uh, a lot of the same. I'll do Iowa Rutgers under. I'm taking every under until the end of the season. Our offense has just put up 170 yards against Northwestern. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to do Minnesota at minus one at Purdue. November football time, you got to be able to run the ball. And I think Minnesota, you know, probably got pretty unlucky against the Illini. They fumbled on the opening kickoff, gave up a touchdown, gave up a touchdown with 50 seconds left. I think Minnesota is much better than Purdue. Perfect. Um, and I'll do Iowa minus one and a half against Rutgers as well. I just think in this situation, you know, at home in a big game, I'm going to take the, the better program. Yeah. Um, and then Northwestern plus 11 and a half against Wisconsin. I'm not picking Wisconsin to beat anybody by two scores. I think Northwestern really figured out what they want to do on both sides of the ball. They're playing with a lot of confidence. That game's always been tor- notorious been a great game. You know, I think that's been kind of a 50-50 game for the last 15 years. I don't see any change in any time, anytime soon. So, perfect. That's my four picks. Awesome. Go Hawks. Go Hawks. Go Hawks.